You're listening to an AI Introducer podcast from the South China Morning Post. Let me give you an idea of how quickly the news is developing as generative AI, the technology most famously used by ChatGPT, is changing our world. Last week, we brought you two episodes looking at how ChatGPT. Even though it's not officially available here in Hong Kong, was being used by lawyers, catering companies, and most interestingly, by secondary school teachers. ChatGPT is just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many programs that I'm using on a regular basis. Ghostwriter for emails, CuryPod for presentations. I'm using Grammarly all the time. We look at the draft rules and regulations for AI released from Beijing's Cybersecurity Administration, and how they will apply to China's big tech companies. As I'm recording this episode right now, five of those companies have already announced that they are releasing new AI systems based on the ChatGPT model. And we also asked whether China, the USA, and Europe. Could find a way to agree on how to regulate this technology. What concerns me the most is the concern that in the U.S. and maybe to a certain extent in China, we might shy away from regulating technology because of this feeling of a AI race, a race to push the technology, you know, as far and as fast as possible. There's a lot of problems with the way AI is deployed today. A lot of people that it impacts that are hurt by it, and there's big picture sort of long-term concerns about what happens if we keep pushing the technology further. What if we keep building the models bigger and bigger? It feels like every other day there's a new development in AI that's causing concerns. Over the weekend. A fierce debate emerged after it was revealed that the winning photo of the Sony World Photo Competition was in fact generated by AI. Boris Eldoxen, the photographer who submitted a black and white portrait of two women, refused to accept the award. I wanted to see if、uh, competitions are prepared for AI images to be handed in, and、uh, they are not. It's very. Um, important that they are aware that、um, there will be more and more AI-generated images in photo competitions, and it should not be mixed up. It's two different things. They look the same, but they shouldn't be in the same category. And in the last couple of days, the music industry has been shocked by the arrival of this song. It's a song made by recording, sampling, and cloning the voices of Drake and The Weeknd, and then using AI to create an entirely new song that sounds like them, but it's not them. The record company said it's a breach of copyright law. But let's see how long it takes for someone to clone the voices of dead musicians. And start making AI collaborations. How long until we hear a new song with Freddie Mercury on vocals, the artist known as Prince on guitar, and Tupac Shakur rapping? Meanwhile, in mainland China, there are more people finding out just how far generative AI can go. And it's not just everyday citizens climbing over the Great Firewall to use ChatGPT. Some of the people using it work for the People's Liberation Army. And here in Hong Kong, the global financial hub connecting mainland China to the rest of the world, ChatGPT has been adapted for people investing in the stock market. Welcome to Inside China. And welcome to another episode looking into this year's biggest development in technology so far, generative AI. This was originally a two-part series, but there's so much to talk about. We've done another episode. I'm Holly Chick. I'm a science reporter at the South China Morning Post here in Hong Kong. And let me start by asking you a question: Would you use an AI to imitate a dead relative so that you could pretend? To speak to them, 
because what was science fiction a decade ago became reality a week ago. You might remember an episode of the TV show Black Mirror back in 2013. It's called Be Right Back, and the plot is about a woman who uses an artificial intelligence service to imitate the voice and memory of a dead boyfriend. I never express suicidal thoughts or self-harm. Yeah, well, you aren't you, are you? That's another difficult one, to be honest with you. You're just a few ripples of you. There's no history to you. You're just a performance of stuff that he performed without thinking, and it's not enough. Well, last week, a man in Shanghai did pretty much exactly that, except it was with his grandmother. A 24-year-old graphic designer used ChatGPT to train the AI to behave and speak like his dead grandmother by sharing details of family background and how she spoke. He then used AI to clone her voice using recordings of his phone conversations with her. And that. And it's not just the voice of his grandmother that was brought back from the dead. The man used old photos and imaging software to create a dynamic image of his grandmother. She has grey hair, no teeth, and her mouth moves when she speaks, making his dead grandmother look very much alive. The video chat he posted online attracted millions of views and comments. Everything from... It is a way to relieve one's sorrow. What this blogger did is meaningful. The company of an AI is still a form of companionship after all. To sentiments such as this. It is not the real her. Isn't he afraid when talking with her? I think he should just let his grandma rest in peace and miss her in his heart. But that's not the only use of AI in China in the last week that's worth paying attention to. A week ago, a team of Chinese scientists from Wuhan University gave full control of a surveillance satellite orbiting the Earth to an AI system for 24 hours. Well, just to see what happens. Once again, what used to be science fiction is really starting to look like reality. Skynet! Skynet is the virus! It's the reason everything's falling apart! Skynet has become self-aware. In one hour, it will initiate a massive nuclear attack on its enemy. What enemy? Us! Humans! And before you say it, yes, that really does bring us to the question of a treaty a global treaty that covers AI weapons. I'll be back. We'll come back to that subject later in this podcast. But let's start with something a little less terrifying and much closer to home here in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong stock market has more than 2,500 listed companies and has an estimated market capitalization of more than 5 trillion US dollars. Hong Kong is also home to a company called Tiger Brokers, a company with more than 9 million users and 2 million account holders trading in stocks around the world. Its website also boasts that it's the fastest growing online brokerage for millennials and Gen Z investors. And as of this week, these people will be getting access to a chat GPT based tool that aims to help them make investment decisions. Jack Lee works with Tiger Brokers, the brokerage behind Tiger GPT. Can you take us through how you envision Tiger GPT being used? Can you give us a hypothetical example? I can give you some scenarios where Tiger GPT can be used to answer queries. Um, the first scenario would be companies' data, such as PE and PB, and compare companies based on key indicators so that investors can have informed decisions before making informed, wise, as well as efficient investments. The second thing would be the financial results, including companies' earnings, results, and analysis from various sources. Also, Tiger GPT is able to provide stock insights, which are references from various analysts and target prices. This is actually key info before making investments anytime. The next thing would be stock movement insights, as well as reasons behind these movement anomalies. 
Of course, Tiger GPT is, is capable of giving information about recent affairs insights. Uh, for example, how will OPEC's surprise oil cut affect the oil company stock prices? And you can ask all these questions to Tiger GPT, and uh, we are trying to let Tiger GPT give you the ideal answers. There have been some very public examples of the kind of errors or false data that get generated by ChatGPT. How are you guarding against this? Well, this is a very interesting question. So, um, of course, our ultimate goal in deploying Tiger GPT is to offer reliable, informative, and accurate responses to inquiries as much as possible. However, even with such advancements, Tiger GPT may still provide inaccurate answers. Hence, we strongly advise our users to cross-check the data and facts in Tiger GPT's answers. But the good news is, at this stage, we're confident to say that Tiger GPT is more qualified in providing content regarding market movements, which are quite important. Uh, for example, single stocks and the financial news. Due to its access to the powerful financial data pool on our flagship platform, Tiger Trade, as is ongoing that we're continuously integrating the latest knowledge as we train Tiger GPT, and our team of engineers works to expand the Tiger GPT's knowledge pool on a daily basis. This process involves regular updates to the financial database that Tiger GPT gets this information, along with current financial news and market quotes. As you said, Tiger GPT is the finance industry's first investment AI assistant. What responses are you getting from the Hong Kong financial sector for this product? Well, um, Tiger GPT is in a public test phase as of now. Uh, so is in Hong Kong. And for the sake of collecting feedback, we can leverage to improve this feature. Uh, right now, many users, including those from Hong Kong, are actually uh, participating in the test. And the general feedback has been great as Tiger GPT um, is trying to help them, you know, get the information from the market to help them with, with the investments. So for now, uh, we are taking into account the test user's feedback and troubleshoot issues. And uh, we are expecting this feature to be officially online very soon, including to our users in Hong Kong, since it supports Cantonese and traditional Chinese languages. Yeah, what about on mainland China? Is there interest from mainland investors? Of course there is interest, but we do not really have any plan in launching this feature in mainland China. Has there been any mention of regulation either by Hong Kong or other financial centers with this kind of product? Not yet, but we are keeping an eye on regulators' move globally, especially in financial centers with a global influence. So our top priority is to stay compliant in all the markets where we operate. Our stance has always been clear that we believe that AI systems and technologies should be subject to rigorous safety evaluations. And um, regulation is needed to ensure that such technologies are adopted properly, ethically, and legitimately. And we are active in interacting with regulators in different markets, including, of course, regulators in Hong Kong on how AI could best benefit end users within the regulatory frame. As we know, ChatGPT is not officially available in Hong Kong yet. Is this a temporary loophole? Mm, I wouldn't think so. Because users would want to have innovative products and services as much as possible. So instead of calling it a loophole, I'd rather call it like a, a herald especially in the investing uh, arena that uh, our users as well as investors could have more, you know, opportunities and could have like more knowledge as well as information before they're making investments. And I think that's actually an innovation. Jack, when do you see it being released to the public? I can tell you very soon because we're actually in a very frequent tests right now and um, our language supports already. And once we pass this test from the public users, we, we will just release this feature. Are there plans for it to go global as well? Once Tiger GPT's feature is online, it will be ready in all the global markets where Tiger Brokers has its presence. For example, Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, 
New Zealand. That's lovely. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for your time. And we look forward to seeing this being released. Thank you a lot. Nice chatting with you. So that's how ChatGPT is being introduced to the global financial markets from Hong Kong. But meanwhile, across the border, the People's Liberation Army has just published its first analysis of how it might use ChatGPT. This article was written by a lecturer from the Army Command College in Nanjing named Mao Weihao. And my colleague in Beijing has been reading what it had to say. Richard Zhang is a fellow science reporter with our Beijing Bureau. Welcome to this podcast. Hello. Richard, can you take us through what you've learned about the People's Liberation Army of China looking at the possibilities of ChatGPT? I have to say that since the beginning of this year, everybody is paying attention on ChatGPT. And uh, even the Ministry of Science and Technology, they are paying attention to that. And uh, I think this is uh, the PLA's first time to respond to such things. And uh, in that article, they gave us an example of how GPT-4 or all, all such uh, large language models could be used in the military field. Well, that article, the analysis, was written by a lecturer with the Army Command College in Nanjing. What uses does he see for it? So I think uh, Mao gave two examples in that article. The first is uh, about battlefield intelligence system. Like during peacetime, ChatGPT could be used to gather intelligence by helping to analyze vast amount of data from the internet, improving efficiency, and finding valuable information. Like uh, in wartime, it could generate comprehensive battlefield reports and making planning more efficient. That is a collecting information part for the ChatGPT. Another usage could come to some radar system or drone swarms. Like uh, if there are a bunch of swarms that need to be directed by a commander, uh, ChatGPT could use the supercomputing ability to just uh, direct uh, the movement of, of the whole army. He also mentioned something called cognitive warfare. What exactly does that mean? So cognitive warfare, as the name, is, uh, is how the AI could manipulate people's uh, perceptions. Uh, I will give you a simple example, like uh, people use ChatGPT for information querying, and uh, ChatGPT give answers. If this could be controlled by some, like we say, governments or some army, and they could create false statements. Uh, in that way, manipulating perceptions could damage the government image or change the public stance. And uh, in that way, they generate a lot of untruth information. So that's kind of like weaponizing propaganda and information warfare. So on the SCMP.com, we've been publishing articles over the past years, which detail China's military development of AI, therefore fighter jets and weaponry. Did Mao talk about China's existing military AI programs? Uh, that was a good question, but I don't think Mao is covering any of their current plans. As we know, OpenAI is an American company, and uh, if there is an emergency uh, situation, I don't think the PLA army is going to have access to that OpenAI, and they definitely need to develop their own such AI models. We've been talking about the positives of using AI in military. What are the negatives? Yeah, uh, Mao gives some examples on that. Uh, he said performance are highly depending on the training data. That means if AI system want to target a human, it must recognize human at first and from the very beginning. But now some technology could deceive the AI, uh, such as a research in Belgium, which found that a software could be deceived if human wears a particular A4 size color pattern. If the AI system could not recognize a human, they can attack the human. Another point is AI is not creating like new knowledges. They just can break conventions. And some innovative tactics could be crucial for in the future. For example, if I want to uh, destroy a target, that's just a simple idea, but maybe in AI's mind, it could uh, surround it. So in AI's mind, it is a... Uh, getting inspiration from the knowledge or from the data that was used to train it with. So it's not coming up some new conventions, some innovative tactics. But for human commanders, 
they can always give come up with uh, new things. That is what AI can react to. So there's a lot happening in this space. And Stephen Chen, my colleague on the science team, has written a lot of articles over the years on scinput.com about how Chinese military is using AI. Follow our latest articles on scinput.com. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for having me. It's about this time we could turn on the theme music from the Terminator films and really turn up the techno fear. Last week, for the first time ever, Chinese scientists allowed a surveillance satellite to be completely controlled by an AI system for 24 hours, letting it search out its own areas on the planet to watch. But the reality is we're not looking at a dawn of Skynet, or not just yet. The AI system was given control of the camera on the Qiming seeing one satellite, not course or orbit control. But as you heard from Richard, there's also a lot of research going to using AI to control drone swarms. And you can add this to the list of stories we've been publishing on scmp.com about China developing AI piloting systems for fighter jets and for using AI in targeted artillery systems and for planning different scenarios over what resources it needs to develop island bases in the South China Sea. Last week, we spoke about trying to find a way for China, the US and Europe to agree on rules for AI in terms of civilian use. But what about the military? We need someone whose research is all about China, technology and international arms treaties and agreements. My name is Amy Nelson. I'm a Rubenstein Fellow here at the Brookings Institution in the Foreign Policy Program and with the Strobe Talbot Center for Security, Strategy and Technology. My work focuses on issues at the intersection of national security, foreign policy, technology, specifically weapons technology. Dr. Amy Nelson is currently working on a book about next-generation arms control, and she has written extensively about dual-use technology, nuclear weapons, and U.S.-China technology competition. Dr. Nelson, back in December, you published an analysis of the PLA Strategic Support Force. Can you take us through what that organization is and what you know about its approach to AI technology? So we set out to look at what was the strategic support force that was so often mentioned in the same breath as artificial intelligence, innovation, adoption, integration in the PLA, and was it going to prove to be some kind of special sauce. And um, what we found was that it is at best opaque and maybe even not fully fleshed out or envisioned from the end of, of the PLA. So what we know is that SSF or the Strategic Support Force's overarching purpose is to obtain information dominance. And this might be for the purpose of improving integrated joint operations, but it definitely plays a role in surveillance and reconnaissance that will further enable operational and strategic objectives for the PLA. We know that the SSF is focused on AI-related equipment contracts or that a number of AI-related equipment contracts are for the SSF, but we don't think that the SSF is is a primary hub of innovation. And then to your question, we identified 12 possible major military applications of AI with the broad categories of space operations, cyber operations, and electronic warfare being the most either prominent or readily mergeable with AI. They sort of naturally lend themselves to the use of AI, um, and they seem to be the, the most furthest developed applications. From what you wrote in December to what you've seen in the last few months, has your perspective changed on that? My perspective really hasn't changed. Um, We're not getting new information that's in conflict with pre-existing information that we had or what we expected. Um, The ChatGPT development, the use of ChatGPT for operational information really just shows that China is willing to use open source technology to enhance information dominance, whereas they might previously have developed an indigenous technology. That said, ChatGPT is largely untested 
in these areas and for these purposes. And I would expect it to be if integrated into a system, a, a fragile component. The global narrative on AI is currently dominated by Microsoft and OpenAI's ChatGPT, as well as Google, all of which are U.S. companies. But in China, we're watching at least five big tech companies, as well as startups, racing to catch up. In terms of AI military applications, if China makes a giant leap forward in that area, will it result in an immediate escalation from the U.S.? Are you concerned that we'll be heading into a Thucydides trap? Right. So the Thucydides trap is when a rising power challenges a a hegemon for dominance in the system, and the system almost coaxes out of the rising power and urges the rising power to challenge the hegemon. And it's, well, first of all, it's really unclear who the rising power and who the hegemon is here in the, the use of technology, these, these kind of enabling technologies and warfare, because we haven't seen much of it in play, certainly um, very little in play by the Chinese. And second, AI is but one enabling technology. And so were China to, for example, dominate in the application of these natural language processing models to achieve military information dominance, would it even have access to sufficient semiconductors, the chips that make this all run? So no single technology alone right now is a a slam dunk. It's rather a a technology cornucopia, and we don't know who is best at developing that or applying it. So let me turn to one of your other areas of expertise, international arms control. You've written extensively on the issues of U.S. and Russia nuclear weapons reduction, as well as the New START Treaty, the nuclear arms control treaty between the U.S. and Russia that Vladimir Putin recently suspended. Ever since the emergence of ChatGPT and the rapid development of AI, have you had thoughts on what it will take for an AI arms treaty? That's a great question. So AI is uh, not a weapons technology per se, um, also because it is not something that can be seen and counted for all these reasons doesn't really lend itself to the kind of arms control agreements that we've come to associate with, you know, great power cooperation. The question is, what is AI enabling and, and can whatever it's enabling be limited, moderated, eliminated, attenuated through an arms control treaty? And I think that we certainly could talk about the military applications of artificial intelligence. And we certainly are having these conversations about how to make it more reliable and trustworthy, including ruling out the use of AI in fully autonomous, potentially catastrophic situations, for example. And these are very important conversations to be having. I think it's also really important to note that AI by itself isn't destabilizing. It's not going to throw off the strategic balance on its own. And the question is, as we've understood it as scholars for decades, is when does the offensive have the advantage over defensive such that we we run into something like the Eucydides trap, where the major power that's in possession of, of offense-dominant weaponry, therefore, is incentivized to go first. Where AI-enabled systems are concerned, I'm not sure that we fully know what that means yet. We're still figuring that out. You spent the last 15 months very concerned about the Ukraine war and the Sapolishia nuclear plant. Can I ask, what keeps you up at night with AI weapons development? I think it's no surprise that what keeps me up at night is the idea of this increasingly potent technology in the wrong hands. So as I said earlier, AI by itself isn't threatening, but it's incredibly enabling. It's also incredibly open source, easily transferable, and just as easily misused as it is used. And so I worry about um, kind of nefarious sabotage by non-state actors. I also wonder what, what kind of weapon a terrorist will be reaching for in 10 years time. Um, we've based a lot of our understanding on what terrorists want and how they behave on 9-11, but, you know, the world has offered up an entirely new basket of capabilities to reach for. And so when you are a non-state actor in a restricted environment, the incentive to reach for a different kind of tool, I would imagine, is growing. And that keeps me up at night. 
Let me talk to you about what it's like to be a science reporter, not a science fiction reporter, and find yourself presenting a podcast based on facts that ends up quoting Terminator movies and the Black Mirror Netflix series. It's interesting, it's fascinating, it's a little terrifying. It's definitely not what I expected to report on at the start of this year. And before you ask, yes, maybe I'm a little worried about the technology behind ChatGPT one day taking my job. But the reality is, I'm actually using this technology every day to help me analyze and summarize lengthy research papers and studies. And as I said at the beginning of this episode, it seems like every day we are reporting on someone somewhere in China doing something new that we never thought possible with ChatGPT. Everything being imagined into reality from inside China is reported on scmp.com. My name is Holly Chick. Thanks for listening.